Hello and welcome. My name is Tamar Friedman. I'm the Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And I'm so happy to welcome you to this evening's program, Canvas Presents Cocktails at the Museum at the Museum and Evening of Art and Philanthropy. This evening will be far outside your typical Zoom experience. We will tour the Coast to Coast exhibition, Dwelling in a Time of Plagues, with the artists and museum directors who, whose collaborative work caught the attention of the art world and received global acclaim this past Sukkot. Dwelling in a Time of Plagues is a Jewish creative response to the real world plagues of our time, funded by Canvas, a Jewish arts and culture funding collaborative in incubated at um, JFN. And now I'm happy to introduce Mary Ann Weiss, who is involved with Canvas and a supporter and funder of Canvas to get us started today. Thank you, Mary Ann. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Mary Ann. I am um, a program officer at the Schusterman Foundation based in DC. And I, um, I just wanted to share a little bit about uh, as a funding partner representative, why um, arts matters to Canvas partners. Um, but before I jump in, I just wanted to say thanks to Canvas, JFN, all the artists and organizations. Um, as not an artist, I'm really humbled and um, just by the creative and um, just the amazing artists that are on this call. So um, thank you to you all. So why, why does art matter to us? Um, beyond supporting art for art's sakes, we believe that arts and culture are critical components of a vibrant Jewish life. Arts and culture brings people together. It educates and engages. It infuses pride and it preserves, expresses and revives the collective Jewish story. Building and sustaining Jewish community depends on a vibrant art and culture sector. This is particularly important in this moment we find ourselves in where people are yearning for connection and meaning and arts and culture is a way that um, we're finding that. We also know that arts and culture is in great need of, Jew of um, support and recognition, especially in the Jewish space. We think that Canvas can be a powerful vehicle for bringing new levels of support, collaboration, and visibility to the field. As a collaborative model, we believe that we can do more when we work together. And this collaborative approach is reflected in the exhibits you're about to see. It's a real collaboration, a moving collaboration between four networks, three museums, and the 14th Street Y three world-class artists and dozens of other creatives. This is also a new effort, um, a new journey that we find ourselves in and we're learning along the way. And we're also experiencing the best the Jewish creative community has to offer in the process. So we're excited to invite you into this process to learn and experience it for yourselves tonight. Um, on that note, I will pass it to Lou Cove, founder of Canvas to get us started. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, thanks to JFN for hosting us tonight. I have a quick public announcement, uh, public service announcement, which is if you are wearing restrictive clothing, put your camera and change right now. Because you have about five minutes until you're going to be led in a movement exercise with former Alvin Ailey dancer extraordinaire, Adam McKinney. Um, you don't want to miss it, and you want to be limber for this exhibition tour. So you have our permission to don your sweats if you haven't already. Um, but keep listening. Uh, because we have important things to say. If your clothes are loose, if you're not, you may start drinking your cocktails now. Uh, Marianne said it, we created Canvas because we care deeply about Jewish art culture. And as funders, we recognize its potential to further our own philanthropic priorities. Uh, many of you have heard me say before, we believe in a 21st century Jewish cultural renaissance. And you don't get a renaissance without a few Medicis, generous patrons who value the work, which is why I want to thank our five founding partners, Schusterman, Jim Joseph, Righteous Persons, Pella, and Klarman Family Foundation for coming together to support Canvas. They came aboard not to a closed club, but to encourage others by their example to support this field, and it's working. Tonight, I'm pleased to announce a sixth part that has officially joined just this week, uh, the Jack, Joseph, and Morton Mandel Foundation. We're so glad to have them, and we're so glad to have all of you with us. So thanks for joining. Uh, Canvas is not just about funding arts. It's also about advocacy and education about the field. So if you like what you experience tonight, I want to invite you 
to join our new funder peer group, which is dedicated to learning more about the field. We'll meet once a month for a lunch and learn, no financial obligation, and we will be joined elite artists and experts. And one of our first guests is going to be Osvaldo Goliov, who is a MacArthur Genius Award-winning composer, subject of a major New York Times profile over the weekend. This is all happening because of the imagination and the hard work of four of our network grantees, Asylum Arts, LABA, Reboot, and the Council of American Jewish Museums. And by joining together, they and the participating artists and museums have all found larger audiences, written up in national and international and elite arts locations, and will hopefully garner more recognition and support as a consequence. So we really view this project as a win for strategic philanthropy. It's a win for Jewish arts and culture, and it's a win for everyone who participated. All become greater than the sum of their parts, and that was just for Sukkot. Wait until Passover, because we've got a whole other round coming. Before we get there, I want to introduce you to the woman who conceived of and curated Dwelling in a Time of Plagues, the Executive Director of the Council of American Jewish Museums, Melissa martins Herbam. Thank you, Lou. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to be here tonight. I am excited to share this project with you. We uh, started thinking about this in late summer. And as you know, we had all been through a season of Pesach where we experienced holidays like we've never experienced them before. While we were disconnected physically and geographically, there were so many people still seeking meaning and beauty for these times. And as an initial grantee of Canvas and having access to the other executive directors of the networks, we started talking and thinking that if we were to activate the talents and creatives within our collective networks, that we could really start to address this problem, not next year, but immediately. So that's what we set out to do. We started with the hypothesis that if there are people seeking Jewish experiences and meaning, that we could pair them with museum sites within the network of Cajun, we could activate artists and we could ask them to respond to issues of our times and the holiday. And as we looked at the calendar, we realized the holiday of Sukkot was fast approaching. And so we turned to several of our talents that we knew that we could trust to move the work forward with great speed. And with the investment of Canvas, we're able to push the work forward really, really quickly. So tonight we're gonna to see the results of the first round of the work. Um, what also came out of it was really a larger field-wide dialogue. I think we realized we were prepared to work in ways that we hadn't worked before. We asked the museums to activate their outdoor spaces. This required a lot of ingenuity. We asked artists to respond to those sites even if they physically couldn't travel there. And we commissioned site-specific work within a few weeks. So it was really a unusual project. It was asking a lot of all the talents involved, but because the ecosystem was working with the investment behind it, we were able to activate it really quickly. So um, the results are the works you'll see tonight. We also were able to get attention of a lot of press. You'll see some of the press that's out there and hyper allergic, Jewish Telegraph Agency, The Forward, Dance Magazine, and several other stories that are still coming out. I'm really happy to say that uh, coming up for Pesach for the next round and the next season, we already have 11 cities interested to host works. So the word is getting out there and we're so proud of what we've accomplished so far. So this is a really, for us as people who work on the creative side of Jewish arts and culture, it's an example of the magnifier effect that when people work together, that the what we can do is so much bigger when we are all in it together. But before we get started, uh, Adam McKinney is going to lead us in that movement warm up exercise. So take it away, Adam. Thank you, Melissa. So good to be with you, everyone. Um, uh, Marianne, you shared something so beautiful in your remarks, and it's something about 
uh, the results of COVID-19 and it shows us that we struggle around connection and meaning. And I wonder how through this particular format and program, we might find those two pieces, connection and meaning. And for me as a dancer and a choreographer, I always go back to my body. And luckily we are all dancers because we have bodies. So I welcome us uh, to take the risk and join in in noticing our breath. So I'm gonna take one hand to my chest and uh, just another hand to my belly. And just for a moment, just I welcome you to notice your bodies. And notice your breath. Good job, you're doing great. And so I welcome us as we take a set of 10 breaths that our hands might respond to the inhale and that our hands will respond to the exhale. So every time we inhale, I welcome us to expand the lungs and expand the shape that you're making in your Zoom rectangle. And as we exhale, we come back to our bodies. And you might notice that your shapes might get bigger and broader the deeper you breathe. And your shapes might change. You might notice that you need to turn away from the screen to create a shape in your real space around you and then come back to the virtual space to bring the meaning of your personal space into our connectedness. And that your shapes will inevitably change. And trust your bodies, let your bodies uh, make the choices without having to rely on our minds for the moment. Always coming back to your center, maybe three more shapes, three more breaths. Going inside as deep as you can inside and as broad as you can outside. Really good team. I could do that all night, but we, I think we're gonna keep moving forward. Lou, I loved the hug you gave yourself. That was pretty glorious. Thanks everyone. That was beautiful. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, we Adam. really appreciate that. I'm gonna share my screen just to introduce you to the museums and the artists we're gonna hear from tonight where we would normally be together for an exhibit opening in a really different way. I will share a few images. So to get to know our project, Dwelling in a Time of Plagues, you could see there's a little bit of a doorway or a, a keyhole in the center of our image. And we're gonna take you through that keyhole. You'll get to see work at the Holocaust Museum LA, at the Jewish History Museum in Tucson, and at the Jewish Museum of Oregon. 
what we would normally be together at a reception that might look like this for an exhibition. We would bring out the, the catering and the hors d'oeuvres. We would get the, the really good fruit platter. But tonight we're gonna have to use our imaginations to travel across these different cities to see the first iteration of this project. And we're gonna look as we approach, we are going to take our first stop in Los Angeles and approach the Holocaust Museum LA. And with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen to introduce my wonderful colleague, Beth Keen, the Chief Executive Officer of Holocaust Museum LA. Take it away, Beth. Thank you, Melissa. It's so nice to see everyone. Um, this is very thrilling um, because we, can, we get to say thank you to all of you um, virtually. Um, and um, before we take you through our presentation, I just wanna make sure, um, Jordana, is that, that's our screen that we're sharing right now, right? Okay. It can everyone like see it? Okay. Um, it's not a Zoom so, call unless we make sure that everyone can see the screen. <laughs> yes, we can see it. <laughs> so we're going to kick off our presentation. My colleague, Jordana Gessler, our director, our uh, vice president of education and exhibits, um, is first going to share this um, short video that was um, put together by LA this week, um, which was one of the news channels that covered our exhibit. And it'll give you a really nice overview of um, what it was all about. So I'll let Jordana um, hit play for that. Holocaust Museum LA is thrilled to debut its first exhibit since the pandemic started. This uh, exhibit is a, an art installation in honor of the Jewish holiday, Sukkot. So the idea is that this year we can't gather in a suit coat together because of our circumstances. So my reimagining of suit coat uh, is a Hollywood era movie house. So it's kind of an homage to the golden era of Hollywood. The purpose of the exhibit is to house and honor the virtual stories of our elders been traveling the country over the last three years, interviewing older role models in their 80s and 90s that really show what it means to have a great last act of your life. We all need to learn from our elders. They inspire us, and that's what really helps us get through this you know, challenging time right now. I've had the, the good fortune to interview um, Larry King and Norman Lear and Ellen Burstyn and Tommy Chong uh, and uh, Carl Reiner, which turned out to be his final interview. The most interesting thing right now is that el our elders are overlooked community, yet they're the most resilient to deal with this moment in time. And they have the stories, the experience. They've been through so many different experiences to teach other generations that really haven't had maybe this hardship before. How do you deal with this? How do you get through it? Um, how do you stay positive? How do you live your life in a way that's meaningful? How do you find the blessings during this difficult time? time and to be able to visually hear you know a uh, holocaust survivor to stand here in a park so being socially distanced you know in a very safe way it's it's very different than just sitting at home watching something on your computer my attempt at building this is really to house the stories of our elders and it's a call to action that hopefully you'll come out enjoy this and then call your grandmother, call your mother, call older loved ones in your life, talk to them, because time really is of the essence. Holocaust Museum LA is um, the oldest Holocaust Museum in the United States. We were founded by survivors in 1961 who wanted to create a safe space where they could remember their family members who perished in the Holocaust, uh, showcase their precious artifacts, and um, start educating young people um, about the Holocaust free of charge. So we teach the history and the lessons of the Holocaust and uh, make it relevant to today's world. And um, we do that through the lens of uh, the survivors um, because we have 
a huge collection of artifacts that were mostly donated by survivors. So we tell their personal stories through artifacts and oral testimonies, which is why this outdoor exhibit um, was such a great, it, it aligned so perfectly well with what Reboot had imagined um, for us. Um, you know, listening to our elders and survivors and learning from them and, you know, learning how to cope, um, how to get through challenging times for us, like a, a pandemic um, is really important. And it's really important for, you know, people to learn from them. So while, you know, the museum has been closed since March, uh, we've really been inspired to open our hearts and minds and, and find innovative ways to commemorate, educate and inspire. So when Melissa brought this opportunity to us, we were really excited and it's been a really wonderful partnership with um, our friends at Reboot and at Cajum and um, it's been successful on so many levels and it's really been amazing to work with such talented people um, and to see the impact that this exhibit has had. It was our first outdoor exhibit. The museum is located in a public park in Pan Pacific Park. And um, this was the first exhibit for us um, that was outdoors. Um, it was really the first exhibit in, in the history of the museum since we've been open in this space. And there's really no substitute for seeing art up close in person, as we know. And, um, and so for us, while we quickly pivoted to this virtual um, environment, um, this really uh, made such a huge difference and provided um, something different to the community and it was family friendly. So I'm gonna stop there just to give you a brief overview of who we are and, and um, what a great partnership it was. And I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Jordana, um, to take us through um, the presentation now. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Beth. So a lot of what um, Beth said, and I'm gonna give the artists space to kind of describe their vision of how they blended Los Angeles history and culture um, the feelings, the emotions, the history, the traditions of Sukkot, and also being aware of what's happening in our world today and current events that are challenging us as a community. And so I wanted to thank everyone on this call for giving us this incredible opportunity. Um, I think, you know, being in a public park and allowing us to engage the public who, as you can see, are walking, skateboarder, you can hear the skateboards in that video, um, bringing their dogs for dog meetups. And it just gave them a space to think, you know, what is this? How can we come together as a community? What are the holidays that we're discussing? Wh who are the elders in our own communities who we can speak with? So I just wanna um, thank everyone for this incredible opportunity and also hand it over to Tiffany and Noam who will tell us more about this incredible art piece and how they engage the public through it. Oh, I'm sorry, Jordana. I just, I first wanted to kick it over to David Katz Nelson and introduce um, the CEO of Reboot just to say a few words. Um, and Thank you. Um, hey, everybody. I see some friends out there and some people who I don't know, but look like they're interested in this work. And that's so appreciative. And I really want to just thank Canvas and Lou and everybody here who has um, inspired us to do this. Uh, Reboot reimagines and re-envisions uh, Jewish traditions and, and stories um, by working with artists who have amazing capacity of doing great big things. And I get to uh, introduce the artist to you today. Um, first of all, I just wanna say to Beth, so great to work with you. You two try to figure out ways of making stories relevant in, our, in today's world. We both are storytellers. And it's just been such a great partnership um, with you guys and such a great opportunity for us um, but to the artist, Tiffany Wolf is a friend. She's an amazing visual artist who came to Reboot a while ago with this idea that you know, there's all these stories that um, each one very, very different and very, very special that are being lost in time. Um, and that you know she wanted to start recording them many times using uh, younger people to do the oral history um, and learn how to edit these oral histories to a place where we can all see them and enjoy them as a way of teaching history in sometimes the most impactful way. Um, and uh, it's just amazing to see how this uh, project has grown over the last couple of years 
and I feel that the uh, the sukkah that we did um, in uh, in LA, the sukkah that she did, um, is just such an amazing um, cap to the very beginnings of this project. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Tiffany Wolf and Noam Dromi, who works with us, who has worked so closely with Tiffany to help develop this project. Um, take it away, guys. Well, hi, everybody. First off, I want to thank you for the incredible privilege and honor to be a, bar a part of this national project, and most specifically in uh, Los Angeles, working with, um, with Reboot, of course, and with Holocaust Museum LA. Um, I'll, just if I can give you a little bit of background. Um, I went to Reboot a few years ago, uh, about three or four years ago, with this idea of trying to capture stories of our older role models and older loved ones. Um, I lost my parents very young, and I realized I didn't have the personal role models on how to navigate life's major milestones and what it looks like to have a great last act of your life, what it looks like to be a great 85-year-old, 90-year-old. So I set out on this mission of capturing stories of everyday loved ones, um, and just everybody has an inc incredible story to tell um, from uh, Barbara Barrel to uh, Risa Eaglefeld, this beautiful 102 uh, year old Holocaust survivors who's, who's taught me and, and audiences who've watched the films about following the blessings no matter what. And then as, uh, as of course COVID hit, we really didn't have uh, the, um, opportunity to continue in the way we were doing it because of being in, uh, in lockdown. So we thought, well, what can we do right now to capture the stories? Uh, and uh, so we decided to, because our older community are the most isolated right now and also the most resilient and have the, the kind of roadmaps on how to have other, help other generations uh, get through difficult times, we decided to use the digital tools we have and we started um, calling uh, the legends we love. So we interviewed Larry King and Norman Lear. And as mentioned in the video, Carl Reiner, who uh, happened to be his last interview, which really showed the time is of the essence to capture these stories. So when we were given this opportunity to house these stories in a way for Sukkot, it was just such a privilege, especially during this time of the pandemic, to have a physical space for people to visit. Um, we we wanted to 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 have folks hear and watch the films, and um, I'll let Noam perhaps jump into, and we can explain Ushbizin of the Silver Screen, which. Um, the Ushbizin are the symbolic guests that come to the Sukkot every night to impart wisdoms of benevolence and kindness and spiritual affirmations into the Sukkot. Um, so we call the exhibit the Ushbizin of the Silver Screen, that we have spiritual guests visiting and uh, that we are having guests on screens because that really exemplifies uh, this moment in time in the pandemic where we're on screens and not able to congregate together. We're gonna scoot ahead. Um, and I think we're going to Tucson next. Am I right, Melissa? That's right. I would now like to introduce you to my great colleague and friend, Saul Davis, who is the executive director of the Jewish History Museum in Tucson, Arizona. And for those of you who have not been physically to that museum, it is doing wonderfully creative work, innovative work, and very socially conscious work. So with that, I am going to turn the floor over to Saul to tell us more about the museum and the project. Thanks so much, Melissa. Thanks to JFN, to Canvas, to Kajum and Laba for making this shidduch between the Jewish History Museum and the visionary artist, Mirta Kuperming, um, for making this shidduch possible. Beyond the powerful work, the sukkah that we are now holding on our campus, we're also holding this very special relationship with Ronit and Mirta and we're deeply grateful for that as well. The Jewish History Museum is located in Barrio Viejo on the southern edge of downtown Tucson. Barrio Viejo is one of the oldest neighborhoods, not only in Tucson, but in the entire region. We're on the ancestral lands of the Tohono O'odham people who continue to live in this region. And we're in the Sonoran Desert. This museum is 55 miles from the US-Mexico border and I'm standing on the bima of the first synagogue built in the Arizona territory. This building is now the flagship of our museum campus. 
And adjacent to this historic temple building is our Holocaust History Center, which is the only Holocaust museum in the state of Arizona. And within the Holocaust History Center is a contemporary human rights gallery that is currently presenting an exhibition titled Asylum that represents the experiences of migrants in these borderlands and raises up all forms of resistance to oppression along the border. So Mirta's sukkah installation titled Clamor en el Desierto, Clamor in the Desert, is situated between the historic temple and the Holocaust History Center. And I'll turn it over to our curator of exhibitions, Nika Kaiser, to speak about the installation. Hi, everyone. So great to be here with all of you. Um, so at the Jewish History Museum in Tucson, we're working within a social history framework. Um, and that is what amplifies many voices, often of those who are marginalized and have underrepresented stories. So this framework is meant to cultivate an inclusive and participatory museum culture. Um, and one element of that work uh, is that we work with local artists as a way to enhance and expand the community of the museum um, to practice the connection of social history um, that's present in that type of collaboration. So the opportunity to work with Laba, Ronit, and Mirta on this project expanded that to an international scale. Um, and the nature of working within a pandemic is inherently collaborative. We found this process to be so generative. Um, imagining the development of an exhibit with an artist and facilitator across the world with a fabricator and team of installers on site um, couldn't have worked more seamlessly. And I think that's due to the nature of uh, how we've all had to come together in this time. So as Saul said, we're located in the borderlands and Mirta's installation speaks to this power, to the powerful obstructions and transcendences of the boundaries that exist here. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll actually just leave it with that. And I wanna pass it to Ronit at Lava to talk about the collaboration a little further and then offer Mirta the opportunity to talk more in depth about the work, but we're so grateful for this collaboration. Thank you, Nika. Hi, I'm Ronit. Um, it's really been the best process imaginable under these conditions. And we are so glad that it will also continue because just last week we had another Laba fellow present at the museum. Um, Laba is a laboratory for Jewish culture at the 14th Street Y in New York. And every day we have a group of fellows from interdisciplinary artists um, learning classical Jewish text in a non-religious setting. And Milta was a fellow from Argentina um, a few years ago. And we always say her presence back then, it was Skype, <laughs> was sometimes stronger than even the people in the room. And we continue to collaborate. And now she is the director of Laba Buenos Aires, which is our hub in Argentina. She's a multidisciplinary artist who has presented all over the world and has had exhibitions wherever you can think. And she's been a, an amazing partner in all of these processes and things we've been going through. So I'm going to pass the baton to Milta to tell us about this beautiful collaboration which came about from this opportunity but was really site specifically developed and thought about. Milta, tell thank us. You. Well, hello everyone. I want to briefly thank all organizers for this opportunity, opportunity and also to Ranit Mushkat Blit and to all of you for being part of this event. I was born and live in Argentina as the daughter of immigrants, both Auschwitz survivors. The issue of exiles, immigration, discrimination, and all kinds of situations lived by those individuals displayed from their homes has always been a very sensitive topic in my outlook. Also the language and the feeling of being a foreigner. Sometimes even in one's own homeland, we feel like that. All these feelings are present in Clamor in the Desert, Clamor en el Desierto. The Tucson Museum is placed, as ever was said already, only 400 meters from the, one of the points of conflict related to immigrants from Mexico. It was for all the above explained that I decided to transform the materials in which fences 
uh, that separate and divide are frequently used into a construction that welcomes anyone who wishes to enter. Otherness and togetherness are the big themes in this sukkah. The first article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights appears written in 50 different languages, traditional ones as well as native people's languages of the United States, but obviously also from Mexico and South America, since I want to point out my own presence. The fact of not understanding is crucial in this work, since it marks the feeling of foreignness. The colors chosen for the Sukkot represent the traditional attributes of, attributes of Sukkot, but what I really tried to capture through this work is the deep spirit of this celebration. The welcoming itself is already a reason to celebrate. The title has the same words in Spanish and English as the recreation from the Hebrew, Kol Koreba Midbar, that is a psalm also used in Christianity as an imploration for help from who feels desperate. 300 eyes and also mirrors are hanging from the walls. Visitors are invited to hang and contribute with this construction and their face and eyes, as well as the environment will appear included, reflected in the sukkah. This project meant a great challenge to me since it showed that despite being at that time in a rigorous confinement in Buenos Aires, thanks to technology, it was not even necessary to leave my own house to build this site-specific installation in another country. This was thanks to the professionals which I worked with, both in Tucson and Argentina. Tidiozeri, who materially cited all my instructions and measurements, took me captive in, inside his phone to choose each material that would be used. During the installing process, thanks to Hava and Nika that were there with WhatsApp video, I was able to comment on details of the construction itself. And after that, this clamor had an echo in New York City. The passage from Sukkot to Simhatora, from Bet to Lamet, and is titled Clamor and the City. It is displayed on the windows of the Y at the 14th Street in Manhattan. I am grateful to all of you. I have learned a lot. Thank you so much. And now, please, Ronit, let's show a little bit of the installation and more. El movimiento de personas en todo el mundo no deja de conmover. Ya sean inmigrantes o emigrantes, exiliados, expatriados o refugiados, todos son desplazados de sus hogares y se hace referencia a ellos en esta suca. The movement of people around the world does not stop steering, whether immigrants or immigrants, exiles, expatriates or refugees. All are displaced from their homes and are referenced in this sukkah. La instalación transforma los materiales de un cerco en un refugio, que da la bienvenida a todos. La humanidad toda está representada en las paredes de la sukkah, ya que éstas se llenan de imágenes impresas de ojos a través de una acción colectiva participativa. This installation transforms fence materials into a shelter that welcomes everyone. Humanity is represented on its walls as they are filled with printed images of eyes through a participatory collective action. Hoy, aunque nuestras bocas estén cubiertas con máscaras protectoras, nuestras voces en nuestros ojos continúan reclamando justicia. Now, Although our mouths are covered with protective masks, our voices in our eyes continue to claim for justice.
Thank you, Ranit. And um, we're just going to show a few images from the 14th Street Y. The 14th Street Y is on a major uh, walkway, and we have beautiful windows, and we are going to present an exhibition. We're going to be the windows of all the three exhibitions in Manhattan in New York. So I'll just show you Mirta's adaptation for one second. So these are the windows of the Y where Mirta unscrolled the sukkah and uh, basically the eyes and the words are present for the people walking by or coming to the Y. I think now we're going to move along to our final location, which is Portland, Oregon. Right. Uh, for those of you who have not been to the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education, it is one of America's regional Jewish history organizations that has grown so steadily and noticeably over the last decades. Its executive director, Judy Margols, has brought their work to the attention of not only the American museum community, she served on the board of American Alliance of Museums, but she's regularly been engaged with the international community of Jewish museums. So we were so excited to pair Oregon Jewish Museum with Asylum Arts and with the artist Adam McKinney. And with that, I will hand it over to Judy and her team. Thank you. We're excited too. I just want to echo the thanks that everyone has offered to the creative vision of Melissa Martin Gaberbaum, Lou Cove, the community of funders, reconnecting with Rebecca Gluber, who I knew way back when, when she attended Reed College and interned at the museum, Asylum Arts, and my indispensable colleague, Alicia Babstein, who you're going to hear from in the breakout room, most of all, the inimitable Adam McKinney. I'm just gonna talk really, really briefly, just give you a little bit um, more of what our institution, the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education is all about. We are um, centrally located in Portland's downtown core. So of course, as we all vividly recall, the pace at which the pandemic closed everything down conflates with the murder of George Floyd. So it was soon after George Floyd's murder that we began offering a number of virtual programs. We were right out there on law enforcement, racism. We did a program about anti-Semitism in COVID with our colleagues in LA and Tucson, discussions about white nationalism. But we were also realizing right then that our physical location, which was closed, should and could contribute to the conversations about racial justice. And you probably know, you probably read, of course, that there have been active protests in Portland since March. So for us, the question was really, how do we center our educational activism, if you will, in our physical space while the, re uh, while the museum remained closed? And what we did is we determined that we could do something by offering valuable real estate. We have 18 large ground floor windows they're free and accessible if we were to put exhibitions facing out into the street. So our first exhibitions actually went up in June. This included a land acknowledgement, which is still posted at the entrance of the museum. So Adam's an installation now, it accompanies two other installations. We recreated John Lewis's ethical will that had been published in the New York Times on the day of his funeral. And we also put up sections from one of our core exhibitions about the history of discrimination and resistance in Oregon. And I'll just end by saying the way in which Adam's installation shelter in place, it just works so deftly, um, helping us to illustrate Oregon's own overwhelming history of discrimination. Just one example, which you'll see when Adam talks about his work, his references to the Ku Klux Klan. Oregon in the 1920s had held the most powerful Klan west of the Mississippi. So really this opportunity, this amazing opportunity to work with Adam with Asylum Arts, Shelter in Place has connected our shared experiences and the way that we reckon with history. So I just enthusiastically turn the program over to Adam who's gonna tell you more about the installation. Thank you so much, Judy. Thank you, so good to be with you everyone. Um, shelter in place, I use this language to declare emergency conditions, not only the global pandemic, but also this particular moment in history when we are working to reconcile historical notions of race and the effects of racism. 
My interest as an artist is to look back to history to make sense of the present. It is Lis Hor. It is our charge to remember as Jews. Sukkot is Zman Simchatenu. It is the time of our happiness. Sukkot for me is a holiday that invites us to go inside and to bring forth those things that we would never show another person. It is an invitation to bear our truths, Sukkot. And so I'm looking at the other side of Zman Simchatenu, the time of our happiness. What is on the other side in this particular moment where we are working to reconcile uh, oppression? And so I chose to invert the Sukkah. I chose to take those things that we hold on the inside and to bear them out, to open our hearts. Uh, I do this to look back to histories of trauma in the places that I dwell and position my gay, Black, Native, Jewish experience on the historical landscape of what it means to heal. Shelter in Place uh, has three main elements, the first being tintype photographs that I took with an amazing, amazing, amazing native photographer based out of Santa Fe. His name is Will Wilson. And there are tintype photographs of me dressed as Fred Rouse. Mr. Fred Rouse was lynched by members of the KKK in Fort Worth, Texas, where I live in 1921. There are no pictures that I've been able to locate of Mr. Rouse. And so I've chosen to use my body as the canvas and as the physical landscape on which I would remember him. And so those five photographs make up a series of tintypes called Scab. Mr. Rouse was a non-union worker. Also looking at historical hurts and what's under a scab. What do we need to pull off to show in terms of those historical truths. Um, there are three photos that were chosen for shelter in place. The second of which you will see is myself dressed as Mr. Rouse in front of Fort Worth's former Ku Klux Klan auditorium that still stands here in Fort Worth. And we are working to acquire and transform it into a center and museum for healing uh, and community. The second element of shelter in place that I'd like to share with you are dance films. The first is called Unfolding History, and it is myself dancing as Mr. Rouse. Um, two um, popular KKK music of the 1930s. I've chosen to bleep out the N-word to think about the power of language and this insidiousness uh, with which uh, language impedes our understanding of who we are in the world and my representation as a black person in the world. And the second film is called Glorious Clouds. It is where I locate my gay spirituality and magic. It is my Shekhinah. It is my divine uh, divine feminine presence of God, and it is located at the intersection. It is at the corner uh, of, of uh, the Oregon um, Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. So I'm going to show you a film now that was created of the exhibit Shelter in Place. Thanks, everyone. So pleased to be with you. Just one moment.
is the schach, it is the branches that we place on top of our Sukkot. Uh, it is all re is also representative of the tree limb from which Mr. Rouse was hanged. I do this work to answer the question, how do we heal? And how do we create the worlds in which we move in the direction of one another. Afafuni. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Adam. That was terrific. And thank you to the team that worked in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I, I just want to say how grateful I am for everyone for working so hard to make this happen in record time, working under really constrained and unusual conditions. And when I think about a time where Jewish life and content isn't going to happen at holiday tables together, it isn't going to happen in synagogues, it will rarely happen inside gallery walls, where will it happen? And I think it's up to people like the people on this call to make sure that Jewish culture still thrives in this era because we have so much to say. In a way, we have even more to say. And it's up to us to make sure that the talents 
and the creatives and the historians and the curators that are ready to tell those stories, find other platforms to tell the stories. So thank you all for these experiments. And Lou, back over to you. Melissa, I couldn't have said more beautifully, so thank you. Um, I, if you haven't, I, I want everyone to just switch to gallery view so that you can see many of us as, as possible, because when we pin these videos, then and you don't get to see the whole. So I, we wish that we could all be together and go and venture to Tucson together and Portland together and Los Angeles together and New York together and share this experience. And we wanted to do our best this evening to try and replicate what that experience might be like. Um, so in lieu of that, we, we've tried to create gallery rooms and we're gonna invite you to choose a room and you can go from room to room. You don't, you don't have to stay for an extended period of time, but your opportunity to actually get to meet the artists, meet the museum directors, meet the directors of um, these networks that, that helped make this possible and, and learn a little bit more about what went into these projects. We are so honored to have been able to support all of you uh, that, have, that have made this possible. And Melinda points out, this was done over the course of just a few short weeks in the summer to prepare uh, for Sukkot. Just amazing what these artists have been able to achieve uh, and the museums and, and the networks. And I've had the privilege of, of being able to work with these folks and speak with them. And I really want to extend that opportunity to you all now.